Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Well now, welcome to Audsell Estate in Salford. We're here as part of a week of special programmes as we continue our Housing Britain series. Tonight, we look at regeneration and gentrification as property prices here soar. We ask where gentrification leaves, the communities it transforms. Is it a panacea for modern Britain? 25 years ago, the Audsell Estate here in Salford was notorious for riots and for its rundown neighbourhoods. Since then, a £100 million facelift has transformed these streets. And this pub, the Welcome Inn, has watched it all happen. So what has happened to the people who call this area home? How many feel life is better and how many feel left behind? Fatima Manji has this special report. Audzel is on the up. Sometimes it feels like a crane looms on every patch of sky and a promise of a shiny new future is plastered on every corner. New apartment blocks shoot up and sell out in this sought-after patch of land between Manchester and Salford's media city. But who will Audsall really belong to? 30-year-old marketing consultant Max Barron is one of the newcomers. Uh, so the proximity um, to the city centre really and, and the location. He's thrilled with his flat in one of the new blocks and thinks this is an exciting place to be for some of the area's residents. I think there's possibly quite a, a divide between the people who've moved in, um, you know, from other towns and cities that live in these apartments to the people that have lived here, you know, historically. And is that divide something that concerns you? Um, I'll be completely honest, and I don't mean to sound callous, it, it's not something that, you know, that day to day uh, affects me. I think it's possibly quite sad if they are being forced out of, of an area that their families have grown up in. Uh, but at the same time, it's the price, I suppose, to pay for development and money being poured into, into Manchester and Salford. Millions of pounds are being spent on regeneration, as Audsall is almost rebranded, now downtown Manchester. Many of the new homes on offer are hotel-style apartments. Some will be bought up by investors who perhaps aren't quite familiar with what the streets currently look like. Behind me is a city with the fastest rising house prices in the UK. And as Manchester booms, it's growing, increasingly encroaching on areas outside of it. Which means places like Audsall, once never considered by property developers at all, have now become increasingly desirable. And where some lament loss of community, others see potential. New businesses are springing up like the gym works. Partners Matt and Carly want to bring health and fitness into everyone's lives. Lots of people will see this and think it's new, it's shiny, it's part of this new development. It's for beautiful people on high incomes to come and work out. No, no, um, I would disagree. Obviously, you know, we're going to have that aspect because people like to train. They've been training for a long time and they've had access to those facilities before. It's really making people inclusive. But while Salford is experiencing a property boom, average salaries have decreased. Many who live on the old estate complain that the much acclaimed regeneration doesn't feel like it's for them. One place that seems to appeal to residents new and old is a newly opened hair salon run by a husband and wife team. Some people were like, oh, this salon looks too posh for the area. Maybe the new things uh, look a bit more expensive. They look like they're changing, we're changing their area and everything. But in fact, just you now people are living together and end of the day, um, they need that service. We're providing it and they can use it. The nail technician has lived in Ords all her life. It's a lot more secure in that way because it never used to be a nice estate at one point, but obviously it's changed and now it's up and coming and people actually want to live here now. <laughs> And one of those people is Nathan. You've moved here a few months ago. Do you have much contact with people who've lived here a really long time? Um, I wouldn't say I really kind of see those, see those people because if I'm going out and things, I go into the city centre, I don't really go to the pubs that are around here or anything like that. Do you ever worry that there'll be two different communities completely divided here? Um, not really. I'm sure that we all can get along well. Um, it's happening, so we've just got to deal with it, basically. Well, now, the Audsall Estate here in Salford sits between Media City to the south and the great city of Manchester behind me. 
Change has come fast to a once much maligned housing estate and for many, regeneration has brought hope. But for others, particularly older residents, gentrification has been unsettling, disrupting communities and demolishing old haunts. Matt Fry hears from some of those here in Otto who long for times gone by. A room with a view. In the distance, Manchester Media City. Less than a mile, but a world away. A room with a view that has changed. Where the park was, over that side, there was all streets and houses. Same with there, all streets and houses. Uh, there was a, a local school, there was a local pub, there was lots of pubs on the, on the road. And now it's just these little boxes everywhere you look. Gordon Brown once described the Ordsell as one of the worst council estates in Britain. Ten years and £100 million later, that would be unfair. Most of the flats here are now privately owned or rented. The place has got an upgrade, but some say that its soul has been downsized. I've lived on this estate all my life. Every house on, on in Odsell at one stage, apart from two church houses, was council. Uh, a community was built. And then we get other stages of uh, redevelopment where gradually the community is smashed. You don't see many children at the end at the moment. No. We had uh, uh, pe parent and children and pensioners all, all right. together, didn't we? All, all the kids grew up uh, with, with the pensioners. That's uh, right. Now, now there's nothing, is there? Yeah. yeah. They're getting priced out of the market, the locals. And it's, I think it's disgusting, to be honest with you. They don't give a Is they? The suits and boots in town. Every last bit of land's being built on. Uh, the sports centre's uh, about to be pulled down to build in another block of uh, apartments. It's hard to... Uh, when you knew all the families that lived here and were, was part of the community and they've all been moved out of the area elsewhere, all over the city. Also, well, it's my roots. Um, you know, I've, I've, I've lived here all my life. I've got a good view. I like to look over the park because it brings back a lot of happy memories for me from when I was a child. Like, I can identify trees and I used to say, I've climbed that right to the top, you know, um, and it brings back memories. It's not the same anymore. Once they put people in new houses, I don't know, maybe some people felt like they got a bit better off and the community just faded away. Um, and it's very sad that that community's gone. Um, and then once you become single, you, you end up being put in tower blocks. Uh, where everybody's boxed off, nobody really associates with one another. I couldn't tell you the name of my neighbours, apart from one. Um, you know, so it's just gone and it's very, very sad. Loneliness stalks these corridors. They too watch the Grenfell fire with horror, but also with awe about the spirit of community born in the ashes. It was proven in Grenfell. The politicians didn't do anything. It was the local people that lived round there. The people even in the private houses and everybody round there just come out and help the best way they could. That's what happens around here. We have to, if we want anything, we have to do it ourselves or create a bit of a ruckus and then they'll come down and do something. But other than that, they'll just, they don't seem to care. it more and the poor that suffers more and it's people like them people that was in them that place and flats. When was the last council houses built on this estate? Probably in the 80s. I don't know. No, I, don't so I can't remember. 
people that have lived on here all their lives and worked hard all their lives now can't even afford to stay in the homes that they've lived in all their lives because of the room tax, can't afford to buy property on here. Yeah. Uh, they, can't, they can't afford the bed, bedroom tax, no, but never mind. it. have for a long, long time. Seven, yeah. Yeah, the loot, it, loot's you in it. You did, didn't you, Linda? I did, yeah. yeah. That was your childhood home, wasn't it? You were yeah. there with your parents. Grew up there. She had to get out. She's what there. happened, Linda? Uh, to the bedroom tax. Bedroom tax. Never caused a problem or anything, paid her rent, but because she couldn't afford that extra money, she had to leave her home, and it's wrong. 100% wrong. The only thing that's all right is the price of a pint. Well, yeah. <laughs> and that's a bit wrong. Children who are, who are just starting out uh, in this area have no chance of getting on the property ladder. I'm glad I'm the age I am. I wouldn't like to be young living around here. Not the way things are going to go now. A lot of history around here in this area. You look at this, I think the Hollies and a lot of the groups started around here. But what can you do? It's progress. Where we live, how we live, who we live next to, this is what matters. In the end, this is what we remember. In the end, this is what we remember. Well, we're here in the Welcome Inn, the bar you saw there in that report from Matt Fry. And I'm joined by my landlady, Vicky. Uh, Vicky, how have things changed for you? I mean, is, is you, you're one of the last two pubs in the whole area, 50 have gone, you used to run the British Legion, that's gone. Um, how have things changed? There's been big changes, mostly to the housing development on the estate. Private houses being built, no council homes, I couldn't tell you the last time. Do they the come in here? No. Not, not many of the newcomers. I think on you've the got estate. three students yeah. across the road. They, they, they come, come in, in and a yeah. couple from the back, but their houses was built in the 80s. But no, it's not generating much business for me. And, and what about you? Because you have been here a very long time, yeah. you, or most of your life. Yeah. How has it changed for you? Massively, really massively. It's changed that much. There's no more social housing. The community really feels like they're being pushed out. They feel like they're being wiped out between Media City and But Laura, Manchester. where do they go? Where, where do they go? Where do who go? The, the people who are pushed out. Uh, they, they come to us, to us community workers, to us real people, to the people who are still out in the community working, trying to hold it together while the developers are coming in and more or less destroying it for us. As, as a resident, that's how we sort of feel. Well, of course, Paul, you're one of the new residents. Yeah, so, I mean, How do you feel hearing that story? Yeah, I mean, well, four years ago, me and my business partner um, moved to the area to set up our brewing business, Shind Shindiga Brewing Co. And for us, <clears throat> we've moved here and it's been a, the opposite kind of story. It's been a really th thriving place and it's part of a thriving Manchester. And for a startup business, Manchester was voted the third best place in the world to start up. So it's, it's been something that's you know, helped our business thrive altogether. Really. But Vicky and Laura are talking about community. And there doesn't seem to be much new community. Yeah, I mean, but communities take, might take a while to develop, and so obviously these new communities that are happening towards the city centre where we're moving in, these new developments, there might be communities um, sort of You're forming. You're a start-up brewer, and yeah. uh, you got Vicky to take your brew yet? <laughs> Not yet, no. <laughs> Would you want her to take your brew? I mean, anyone's welcome to her brew. So. But you see the divide, don't you? Yeah, that, yeah. That you're not coming to her pub, your brew doesn't come to the pub. Yeah. There seems to be a fracture here between the people who used to live here and still just live here yeah. and you incomers. Yeah, I Is there an effort being made to try and push into the old community and see how you can... Not that I'm aware of, no, to be honest. No. Um, I mean, that, that, that is a pretty sad story. And I'm wondering, as a Labour uh, you know, MP, Central Manchester, how you sort of see this obvious divide in what's happening here and what must be happening in developments all over the country. Well, this isn't my patch here. Uh, I know John is no, here no, from, I said from Central Salford. Manchester. Yes, yeah. Lucy but, look, yeah. Um, but I mean, I think you know, community and a, a sense of community, and that that community breaking down is probably one of the biggest issues facing our country today. And when I knock on doors, whether it's in Moston, whether it's in Hume or Clayton, mm. that are just on the periphery of the city centre, mm. mm. those feelings are the big. Uh, issues that people raise with me and it's part of partly about the demise of the pub mm, which is mm. it's not a social housing mm. issue that necessarily but there are other issues there it's a partly about the demise of the high street mm. the changing nature of 
of work, but yeah. also housing that is much less secure than it used to be, and it's right. much harder to create communities in the way that we used to. And I think these. Well, well that takes us very neatly onto, onto John Merry, who's the deputy mayor uh, of for Salford. And what's interesting is that you have uh, obviously been party to what's going on here, but you haven't built any council housing, what we would call social housing. Well, well, first of all, we're intending to build council houses in the near future, actually, using the proceeds that we're getting from developers who are building the other housing, actually. We're getting commuted sums which we can actually put towards But a tiny house. drop in the ocean by it, comparison. It is, and we've got two and a half million compared to Kensington getting 50 million. So there is an issue, and we want the government to be helping us more to actually build that social housing. And, of course, one of the things that was in that report was the bedroom tax, which both me and Lucy campaigned against, tried to get rid of, um, but unfortunately the government appears determined to enforce it and to make rents I impossible for a large number of... But, but, but uh, you're, a, a, you're a Labour authority, but you don't run the housing at all. You have a TMO, no, the same old deal as in for Kensington. That. The reason we did that is because we wanted more investment going into the estate. And the only way that we could get that at that moment in time was by setting up a, a TMO and getting the money. And we thought about this long and hard and we thought, do we put ideology first or do we put the people of this estate first? and make sure they have the cash to have the kitchens and the right. light renewed. Well, what is absolutely fascinating is that if we go to the Conservative uh, deputy leader of Trafford, uh, what is happening here is that you don't build any council houses either. In fact, you haven't got any houses at all. Well, we have a TMO as well. So we yeah. already previously, under the previous Labour administration in Trafford, we transferred our housing stock out. They are looking to develop more social housing uh, in Trafford, and, and, and clearly we're supported of that. The point for me across Greater Manchester is that we need, need more land uh, here to actually develop uh, properties and houses right across accommodation. But more That's land for the better do. off to buy houses on? To provide a mix of housing that appeals to all the people who want to live in our in our conurbation. That's really important to me. It's why we've got a spatial framework which is out for consultation and why we need to make sure we have mm. the land for 220,000 houses, which is what we need over the next 20 years. You see, what one's, on, one's left asking, Philip Lord, and after all you have to think about these things with your raised publica think tank, is... Uh, it should government, should local authority be in the business of directly running housing in just the same way the state is directly responsible for the NHS? Well, if you look at the housing market, it's predominantly de delivered by housing de private sector housing developers and it doesn't work. When the state withdrew from housing building, everything collapsed down to, it's been a 20-year average of 150,000 homes per year against what's most people estimate needed as a quarter of a million homes per year. You know what so, we showed last night? We had Harold Macmillan, Conservative mm -hmm. Prime Minister, actually boasting about having built 300,000 council houses. When I was a child, a council house well, was an honourable thing to have and a thing which was held in mass. Well, two things. First of all, all the people are squeezed out because they don't have property rights associated with renting. I think we have to change our tenure model so it becomes a form of property that gives people rights, which means they can't be pushed out or moved out so that they have a state. Secondly, what we at Respublica are arguing for, and we've been in talks with Number 10, we've been talks with Sajid Javid, uh, the Secretary of State, is actually the state needs to re-enter the housing market. We propose a national housing fund where the state borrows money, okay. all the top housing associations will partner with the state and buy out the state over 10 years. I'll come back and to that, that will give us... We're that will give us the missing factor that, that will fill the we'll, gap we'll that the private sector can't. We'll come back to this strategy in just a moment. There's somebody doing something very interesting here, and that is you, Tim Healy. You're a developer, but you're not, in fact, the standard developer. Tell us the difference. Uh, I think we take an alternative approach. So what we'd like to do is take a, a macro perspective, look at um, de development from, um, from a much more wider point of view and think about the long-term impact. So we've been selling our developments and our apartments to owner-occupiers only. Uh, we won't sell off fractionally to individual mm -hmm. investors. Uh, so no often... landlords can go picking up housing and then privately renting it? That's right, because it becomes a fractional ownership. It becomes a transient population. So whoever buys people, the house lives in it? They have to live in it, yeah. They have to live in it. It has to be for them. To own. But um, you, you, you could be very fat on the profits of doing the other way, which is what most developers are doing. Hopefully, in the long run, it will be. It's more of a 10-year to 20-year approach, and, and that's why you need to take a strategic point of view as a local authority to uh, two areas, consider the wider perspective uh, and, and focus on the long-term aims, not just trying to um, deal with short-term fixes. Uh, Lucy Powell, is housing over for government and local authorities, really, when all's said and done? 
Is it over? Is it over? No, I, mean, it... I mean by that, there is a, a... Even here in this group, there is a disconnect from running any housing. Well, it shouldn't be over. I mean, this is the, the way, it depends on what your, your, whether you mean directly by a council or by uh, stock transfers or social housing uh, landlords. But there are massive issues with housing in our country, and it's the biggest political issue of the day. And the state, in whatever form, whether it is central government, local government, or through uh, social landlords, has to have a bigger stake in that, as Philip was saying. And well, we do, we spend billions of pounds a year on subsidising private landlords through. With housing, housing benefit, benefit. Yeah. and we do nothing for that money. We don't ask for anything. We don't raise the quality of those properties. We don't um, require that people well, have stability in those properties or anything. We'll come and back it's to a these. waste of money, and we could be doing so much more creatively. We'll with come back to these benefit. big issues after the break. Sometimes words alone aren't enough to explain the issues. One man experimenting with a different medium is the poet and performer Tony Walsh. Tony grew up in social housing not far from here in Manchester. And he even credits the roof that the state provided over his head with saving his life. So we asked Tony to write us a poem in response to some of the issues we've been exploring here this evening. Here is Tony Walsh's Ode to Social Housing. They say the swing in 60s, but for most, they never swung. The reality was poverty. My parents, Married young and then moved their newborn baby to a rented, terraced home where it won the lack of heating that would chill us to the bone. There were the Beatles of a different kind, the classic, classic slum. Kathy come home, pregnant, crying, teenage wasteland. Mum. If they catch cold in the black mould, then a child's in trouble soon. And this child lay there dying as a man walked on the moon, aged three, rheumatic fever in a damp home, but alive with my baby sister crying. I was fighting to survive. I was saved by penicillin, our amazing NHS, and a change in my life chances from a change in our address. Council home. A tenancy, an indoor loo as well, three bedrooms and two gardens, and as far as we could tell, it was a home for life. Respectable, presentable and clean, it was civilised and dignified. My mum kept it pristine, well, as best she could, with four of us. She'd make do and she'd mend, and the neighbours did your favours, and we kids played out as friends. Is that too much to ask for in the Britain of today? Why is homelessness and hopelessness and heartlessness OK? Who decided that providing social housing can't be done, that we won't look after others, we'll look after number one? And where's this big society? Is it shrinking like the state? Is it not collectivism that has made this country great? If we will build a new Jerusalem in this green and pleasant land, then who is the we we speak of? Do we fail to understand that we need happy, healthy workers if our nation is to thrive, but most are barely managing? And many can't survive with no safety net beneath them or no roof over their heads or their children now lay hungry with black mould above their beds. In a modern wealthy country, this is nothing but obscene still in poverty in Britain now in 2017. And it has to start with housing, social housing from the Latin socialis, meaning allied. There are other words with that in socialist and socialism, but of course, that is the target to wrap up that post-war progress and to flog it on the market. Always stocks and shares, not housing stock, not sharing, but demeaning. Does it take this council kid to point out equities, two meanings? Well, they're cutting, 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 cut. But now, with people adding family members to remember in the embers of their cladding, let this be the day we see the way to honour all their names. Inequality and poverty, austerity in flames. Well, let's start right away with Alex, who is the deputy leader of uh, Trafford Council. 250,000 residents. How much social housing do you need now? Well, we have um, already have a quite a significant supply of social housing. We're a, a borough of um, a great diversity, so we have some deprived communities, we have some very wealthy But even you would say you, you, what, what we you need, need more. What we need is a range of housing provision in our borough that caters for the aspirations and the needs of our population. Uh, that's what we're looking to do through the spatial framework to provide land and sites so we can deliver that. But I did ask you how much social housing do you need? 
well, we clearly have, like all boroughs in Greater Manchester, a demand for social housing. So, yes, we need more. That's what our uh, uh, housing association is looking to deliver through its through a joint venture, uh, and we're looking to increase that. But what we need is a range of provision, as we do across the whole of the common conurbation. John, here in Salford, how much social housing do you think you need as of now? We need thousands, right? I would say at least four or five thousand extra homes for uh, people to live in because Salford has one of the fastest growing populations in, in the whole of the North West and we need housing of all description to actually ensure that people have got decent homes, whatever price they want to pay. Tony, you hear the politicians. They're answering your cry, but I'm not sure they're answering it quite as you want it answered. We're having a very polite and civilised discussion here, but my poem is an angry one. It's angry on behalf of the hundreds of people who are sleeping in the street just a few yards from where we're sleeping. Where we're standing now, it's angry on behalf of the people who are sleeping four and six to a bedroom not very far from here. It's angry on behalf of people who are putting their children to bed hungry tonight in mouldy bedrooms. It's angry on behalf of communities who see their routes into education blocked, their routes into housing blocked, their routes into health blocked by a government which is dismantling things which we thought for over generations. But is the state the answer for providing housing? Well, what's the alternative? The alternative is the experiment well, it, it, that we're it, living it, with it, now. It could be the alternative down here, which is quite a, a sort of radical move by a developer. To I'm, I'm sure this gentleman is a respectable developer, and, and as has been said, we, we need mixed tenure. People aspire to own their own home. But if we leave social provision in this country to people whose only profit is motive, then we're seeing where that's leading right. us. I see you nodding your head, Laura. Uh, I mean, you clearly do think the state has a role in providing houses. Definitely, 100%. There's not one person who can stand in this room and say that we don't need more social housing. We need more, and we need it more than we've ever needed it now. These, it's brilliant, the development, it's brilliant that people have the opportunity to own homes and things, but they're not affordable, they're not affordable for the real people who are already here in this community. I'm alarmed, Vicky, that we're standing a brewer and a publican, and neither of you know each other, have anything to do with each other for profit, and you both live on the same estate. That, that is a pretty sad state mm -hmm. of affairs. And I see you nodding your head, and I'm wondering what social device might bring you together. Sometimes it's NGO activity, you know, charity, um, you know... I don't know. What, what would begin to build a community out of this very divided uh, but remarkable uh, development here, which of course has come from the wreckage of times past? It's what's happening on the estate, though, is killing our community in a way. Like the, Laura said about the houses that are being built, and you know, the guy over there said before that they're building these houses and they're only um, thinking for people to stay in. That is wrong. You know, they're, back, they're building this property and before they've laid all the bricks, the, house, the flats or apartments are sold mm. and then you've got a private, you've got a, someone coming in and then uh, charging £975 for a two-bedroom mm. box apartment. You know, people on this estate can't afford £975. Mm. Philip Lund, the state, you believe it has a role still? Absolutely, it has a role. Direct? Uh, direct in the sense of it can access money cheaper than anybody else. And we have, at Respublica, the top housing associations in this country that provide the majority of social housing who want to partner with the state. And if the state gives uh, you like that a sort fund... Of I do, definitely. Yeah. But, what, but the point is, is what's holding uh, housing back is speed and scale. Government needs to become a guaranteed buyer for housing. Because at the moment, we're only catering to the private market. There's massive demand that isn't being met. If we can have housing at scale for rent, which the housing associations will do, they will access money from the government, but they will buy out the government. Right, and it right. won't add to the deficit, yeah. and government will get massive tax gains okay. for the reason that Lucy well, mentioned. There, sadly, we must pause it, but I'm grateful to all of you for joining us. It's been brilliant to be here in Salford.